In this video, I'm going to answer the question, what sample size is required for accurate and confident estimates? And I'm going to answer this question in a general sense. So I'm not going to answer it with respect to any specific statistical analysis. I'm going to answer it in a general sense to give you an idea of what sample size is required to get an accurate and confident estimate in most cases. And part of the inspiration for doing this presentation was because what I believe to be a misperception in the general public about what sample size is required for accurate and confident estimates. And I can say that my partner, for example, who's not into statistics one bit, criticized one day a study that was read on the news, and she criticized it for having a sample size of only a thousand people. So she wasn't prepared to believe anything about this study because the sample size was, in her words, so small. Now, this is actually a very large sample size for most contexts. So if there were reasons to criticize this study, it wasn't the size of the sample. So naturally the question becomes, what sample size is required when you hear something on the news or you're having a discussion with somebody about a study that you just came across? Well, to answer that question in this presentation, what I did is I conducted a simulation study. And the scenario was one in which I tried to estimate the male adult mean height in the world, which there's pretty solid evidence to suggest it's about 175.6 centimeters. That is equivalent to about 5 foot 8 inches tall. And so the question in this simulation is how large of a sample size would I need to capture that population estimate of 175.6 centimeters? Well, how I could do that is with a computer simulation. There are programs out there that allow you to estimate variously sized samples from a population. And in this context, you can think of the population as 3 billion people, or you can think of it as 3 trillion people. It doesn't matter for the context of this simulation because the population is actually infinitely sized in the computer program. And so I've specified the population in the program to be 175.6 centimeters, which might very well be the adult male mean height in the population of the world. Now, just for an extra piece of information, I had to specify the standard deviation, which is probably about 7 centimeters in the world as well, if you trust the large-scale studies that have been conducted and published thus far. So the sample sizes I drew from the computer program were as small as 10, which probably is not going to be big enough, but then the next step up was 100, and then 200, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and then 5,000. So for each sample, from a sample size of 10 all the way to 5,000, I estimated the mean height for that sample of data to evaluate the accuracy. So I'm expecting it to see around 175.6 centimeters, but it's not going to be exactly that, especially for the smaller sample sizes. I also estimated the 95% confidence intervals to evaluate the level of confidence I could have in that estimate. Now even a sample size of 10, which is really quite small, it might hit the mark just by luck. And so because we don't have the population value typically when we're conducting research, we don't know if we just got lucky with our small sample size. So we need to estimate the 95% confidence intervals to give us a sense of how confident we can be that we captured the population value, loosely speaking. So here are the results. And what I presented them is, is basically a mean and confidence interval chart where on the x-axis I've got sample size going from 10 all the way to 5,000. And I've also got adult mean height on the y-axis. We can see it goes, the range here I cut from 165 all the way to 185. And so with the sample size of 10, the mean was actually not very far off from the population mean value of 175.6. So that should be somewhere about here. And with a sample size of 10, with this particular sample size of 10, randomly drawn from the computer program, it came out at about 176.5, which really was kind of lucky because with 95% confidence, the range is as much as 181.5-ish, all the way down to 171.75, say. So really a very large range in the 95% confidence intervals. And so with a sample size of 10, you might get lucky and capture the population value fairly closely, but most of the time you won't. And so you should have very little confidence in the estimate from a sample size as small as 10. 
and you're probably not going to be accurate either. Now moving up to a sample size of 100 makes a drastic difference. Look how much the confidence interval has become narrower. Now I'm somewhere between 176-ish and 173.5-ish with an estimate that's about 175. So a huge improvement from 10 to 100. And then moving to 200 is a bit better. And so the benefit of increasing your sample size is actually nonlinear. The biggest bang for buck happens from a sample size of 10 to a sample size of 100 and then gets better at 200 and then it really kind of zeroes in on that 175.6 by about a sample size of 1,000, I would say. Somewhere between 500 and 1,000, it becomes a very solid estimate of the population value because it should be 175.6 and I'm, I'm kind of honing in on that population value with a sample size of 1,000 and very good confidence levels, 95% confidence. The range is very small and is becoming progressively smaller. And so on the basis of these results, which is just a basic simulation, but I do think you can extrapolate these results to a number of other types of scenarios. I would say a sample size of 10 is borderline, not useless, but probably not useful to conduct in the vast majority of research scenarios. There are some exceptions, like experiments where you're manipulating something and you're using it within subjects design. That might not make a lot of sense to people who don't know much about statistics. But I'm just going to state that to cover myself. In the most cases, though, it's not going to be nearly big enough. Once you get to 100, though, it's not so bad. And so that's why I write here, a sample size of 100 is a fair sample size. It's not a good one, but it's a fair sample size for a large number of scenarios in order to get a decent estimate with a decent amount of confidence. But once you get to the 200, 500, you're in a good zone. And so going back to my partner who came across that study for criticizing it on the basis of its sample size of 1,000, she probably would have criticized it even more for a sample size of 200 to 500. But that would have been unjustified in my opinion because if the sample was a good quality one with numbers of 200 to 500, you're probably going to get a good estimate with a good amount of confidence. And finally, with sample sizes of 1,000 to 5,000, you're in the excellent zone when it comes to estimating accurate and confident estimates that are probably going to represent the population value really well. Assuming, of course, that the sample isn't skewed in some way with respect to representation. And so that's why I write here, a sample size of 1,000 is probably going to be really good in the vast majority of cases. And so if, if you hear a finding from a study that has a sample size of 1,000 or more, you can't really criticize it for having a small sample size. It has an excellent sample size. You can criticize it for other reasons, possibly yes, but not sample size. Now, this assumes that the study is using random sampling, which I used in my simulation with the computer program. It was randomly drawing cases from the population in the computer. Now, in practice, however, using random sampling is essentially impossible. And the consequences of that are basically impossible to know with any precision. We know it's a bad thing that we're not using random sampling, but we don't know just how bad it is. And so because that assumption is violated, we always need to take into consideration that the results might be skewed in some way because the sample isn't representative of the population of interest. So if a study is based on a sample size of 1,000, that's good in pure quantitative terms. And so the possibility of criticizing the study isn't on the basis of sample size. It might be on representativeness. And I talk about representativeness of samples in my textbook, How To Stats book. I'll put a link in the chapter. I think chapter three is where I talk a lot about sampling in the context of statistics. And the notion of representativeness represents the idea that your sample is representative of the population of interest. That is, the people in your sample represent the population. So in the context of this basic study where I estimated the height of adult males in the population, I would need to have a sample of males that are representative of the adult population. So it would need to be not a really homogeneous sample of just people living in one little community. It would have to be a diverse group of people who represent the population of interest. So in summary, sample sizes as, much, as little as 100 to 200 can often give you a decent estimate for which you can have some 
confidence. Now a sample size of 500 to 1000, now you're getting into a good level of accuracy and confidence. And again, I want to emphasize that different types of statistical analyses might require larger sample size than 1000, and there are research scenarios that might need larger. But as a general statement, you can usually get excellent accuracy and confidence from a sample size as what seems to be as small as 1000 even if you want to extrapolate that result to the world population.